Okay, and if you couldn't figure out what's back the newbie, you're in the right place because obviously you can't read. <laughs> All right, so we will try to keep this as upbeat and fun as possible. So first off, who's got questions? Anybody have questions at all? Any question right now, I'll answer 100% with total honesty. From this point, yeah. Uh, yes, I could. Anyway, next question. Uh, you got to spot the correct Fed, not the incorrect one. Uh, look at the socks. <laughs> Wrong socks. Uh, that's section two of the lecture. Anything else? Yeah. What's the best site for hacking tools? Um, God, is that the screen? Okay, that's going. Um, best site for hacking tools? Um, I'll come up with something by the end. That's part of the closing thing, places to go from here. Okay, no one asked the million dollar question. Okay, well, we'll get started. Okay, so we'll start off with the boring stuff, such as philosophy. Usually the biggest question that everyone will walk up and ask somebody, are you a hacker? And I find this to be one of the most absolutely humorous questions at all, either to be asked or to ask yourself. Uh, mainly because if you're asking yourself, are you a hacker, or declaring yourself a hacker, you're deciding like you're going to be a car mechanic, you're going to be a lumberjack, or you're going to be a stockbroker. You're looking at it as a profession, looking at it as something you decide one day that you're just going to start doing and go out and learn how to do. And if you decide this, you've already missed the picture. Hacking is a state of mind. Hacking is a way that you look at problems. Hacking is a way of approaching life. It's something you do on a daily basis and you've probably been doing it for the last 10 years and didn't even realize it. You look at problems from a different angle. You don't go things in a classic textbook approach. If you did, you wouldn't be a hacker. Hackers have a tendency to, uh, first time you get you pick up a Walkman, you see what kind of screws are holding it together. You don't necessarily look and see how, cool, how good it sounds. You're more concerned with what kind of drive system it's using. Is it a direct gear? Is it using a flywheel? Is it running on a, uh, using a large rubber ring to drive it? These are the kind of things you, you look at and approach. Uh, the first time, you know, when you get a computer, do you buy a computer? Do you piece it together? If you bought one as a, as a package unit, does the first thing you do is, is uh, avoid the warranty, pull out the screws and see what kind of CPU it's got. Did they rip you off? These are the kind of things a hacker will do when they're doing things. So typically what happens is you come to the realization one day that, oh, well, maybe I am a hacker. Maybe I'm, you know, so that's kind of along the lines we're looking at. Uh, so number bullet point three, establish your code of conduct. This also falls under philosophy. Um, most people have an inherent sen sense of knowing when they're doing something wrong. Uh, you know, walking into the store, punching out the clerk and walking out with a constant cash register, this is wrong. Um, you know, you put in a 25 cents on the gumball machine and two drop out instead of one. Is this, is this wrong? No, you got something for free. You know, that's, this is, ah, Toshiba's. Um, this is the kind of thing that we're looking at uh, with good and evil. It becomes a little more of a gray market, gray area with uh, computers, you know. You decide to run a port scan on an IP. Is this wrong? Yes and no. Uh, have you done anything to this computer? No. Have you intruded on the computer? No. Have you actively broken into and obtained data off this computer? No. So let me paint you another example. How about I come up to your house and I decide to walk up and check your front door? Check the lock, rattle it. Is the door locked? I go to the windows and I push up on all your windows and see if they're locked. I go to your car. I see if it's unlocked. I check the handles. Maybe I'll even take a Slim Jim and see if I can pop that door open. Let's test your security. You know, is this, is this something you would find acceptable? Probably not. And in fact, if you saw someone walking through and casing your house and checking the windows, you might get a little mad and probably call the cops. 
this is what happens in the event of something like a port scan. So, and this, this mentality is something when I tell people to, when you're getting started and getting into this environment, come up with and, and establish what you, what you know to be right and wrong. Now this may or may not be based on laws or such, but you have to look at the big picture. You have to understand what you're doing. You have to understand there is a consequence for every action you take, whether you realize it or not. Um, prime example, uh, a couple years ago there was the large uh, denial of service attack on Yahoo and there's been eBay and such other things. The motivation behind it could be anything from someone wanting to gain fame to someone who got annoyed to someone who's trying to uh, win a bid. I don't know. But when you're looking at this, you have to understand that every system connected in between you and whoever is being attacked is also suffering. These are people, systems you may or may not have a problem with or people and you're affecting their lives and you're making their lives pretty much a living hell when you do this kind of childish behavior. And that's kind of what it boils down to. So. Typically, it's a good idea to, to understand, you know, right, wrong, good, evil. They're real fine lines. They're a matter of perspective. What you might consider to be perfectly accept acceptable, the next guy to you might find to be criminal. And somewhere along these lines, we kind of all have to meet and hook up and understand and kind of have our own space to work with. So that's part of the long the idea of what the philosophy of, of getting involved in this environment is. So. Uh, is that going to work? Oh, wrong one. There we go. Okay. This brings us up to etiquette. And a lot of breaches of etiquette I observe around these, these meetings. So first point, manners. And you don't have to prove anything. Um, actually, let's give a second. How many times, how many people is this your first time at DEF CON? Whoa! Oh, wow, that's pretty cool. All right. Uh, let's see. So, a lot of people. Okay. So, since this is new for all of you, um, something that happens a lot of time with these, and it, it, the, the adults don't tend to do as much as the younger people, but what you have is the first time someone shows up here and they've been in their environment, or they've been online, they do their things, and they have their persona, they feel the need to make an impression on somebody when they meet somebody or they see someone they've seen on TV or read re reviews by or whatnot. They want to impress them. And usually the first thing that happens is they try to impress them by doing the, some of the most stupidest stunts you can imagine. Uh, hang on, let me crack this open. All right. Here's a, here's a prime example from last DEF CON. Myself and about six other guys, all goons or staff or whatnot, sitting around the bar here in the lobby. And about 3.30 in the morning, this guy comes walking up to us with a couple of his friends. And we, we immediately spotted there was going to be some kind of trouble. He looked like Fred Durst from Blimp Biscuit, got the backwards hat, the whole thing, walking up. And he comes up, looks at us, and goes, so what, y'all hackers? And I'm, we kind of look up at him, snicker, and I point him, bar's over there, man. Get a drink, because you don't have one. What do you do? You, you need a drink. He's like going, oh, I get it. Y'all all must be sys admins, huh? You're not going to give out any information. You're going to be like that, huh? And it's like... Dude, it's four in the morning, man. You don't have a drink yet. Get a drink. <laughs> and uh, he kept on and kept on. He got more angry and he kept trying to do something. And he was with his friends and, you know, it, it, went, it went round and round for about 20 minutes till finally he got frustrated and he wasn't getting a rise out of me. And we, we sat around laughing about this guy because, it's, you know, had he walked, man, I was just going to keep going. Dad gun batteries. Uh, had he come up and been friendly, we're all having a good time. We're, we're socializing, catching up on what's happened in the last year and, you know, whatever. And out of the blue, this guy comes up trying to, like, make an impression. It's like, you know, pick, pick the biggest dog you can find and go up and kick it to show that how tough you were that you went up and kicked a big dog. And, you know, it didn't impress anybody. And he kept doing this throughout the convention until finally at one point it got physical with somebody and he was ejected. That's that. Go home. You're not welcome here anymore because you have the wrong attitude. And... You know, it's, it's too bad because it, it was a good environment. It was a chance to learn something, meet some new people, and hook up. And instead, you had, to go and be, you had to go be an ass, and that's it. And now no one will deal with him. And we've got his picture posted in a few places, and he's still a good source of humor. And now he gets to be a topic of the lecture of don't be that guy. <laughs> 
So along those same lines, um, the bullet point two that is a phrase we like to use is shut your mouth and open your ears. When your mouth is moving, your brain usually isn't working. Case in point, I'm a lecturer. So along with bullet point three, uh, don't look with your mouth, use your eyes, use your ears, use your other senses, they're far more powerful than your mouth. If you want to learn something, you need to be quiet and make observations, use your eyes, listen to what people are saying, think about what they're saying, and truly think about it and listen, don't just hear them. And you can, you can, you can get terabytes of information without ever saying a word that way. Um, you know the old phrase keep you know keep your mouth quiet keep your mouth shut and let people think you're stupid don't open it and prove it and this holds true a lot of times uh, because you may or may not know who you're offending or being an ass in front of and that could be someone that could be a really good person to know or a fun person to know but you won't know until after you've probably pissed them off so and it brings us down to point four how to approach people you don't know you see someone interesting, like, uh, I don't know, like you're, you're bobbing around at the lobby and there's Ian Goldberg, and you've heard about him, you've seen Zero Knowledge Net and stuff, but you're not sure how to approach him. Uh, typically, don't walk up and interrupt the guy if they're having a conversation with somebody. Uh, this happened last night. Uh, myself, uh, my friend Justin Bill and Peter Shipley were having a, we were trying to hammer out something that had happened earlier, and these guys, this these two guys kept coming up talking to him at like four in the morning wanting to walk up and, and talk him and touch him and hug him and he looked at him and said will you go away he said yeah but but no go away we're trying to have a talk here had he approached me another time when we were sitting around just chit-chatting or whatnot or, or just walking through the hallway and, and bump into him and say oh hey aren't you so-and-so hey I caught your speech uh, or I saw you on TV read one of your books read a review you know it was pretty good and you know hey I got a question if you got time you, you, you put it at you know their convenience don't demand attention from people because they may or may not be busy and if they're busy and you're demanding their time at that exact moment it's rude and a lot of times you have to just you have to flip places do you want someone coming up to you and doing to you what you're doing to them and if the answer is no don't do it I mean it's it's pretty straightforward I'm like, you know, there's another case point. Which one of the guys in the back was laughing? They asked me, oh, are you going to go up and tell them all don't be an ass? Yes. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell people don't be an ass. Um, and then the last bullet point kind of goes along a little bit with philosophy with maturity and temper tantrums. And, you know, someone on IRC says something you don't like and you decide you're going you're gonna to pack at the guy. Okay, that's cute. That's real mature. Nice. You're, uh, you know, so you're five hops away from the guy. So basically you got three systems in between that you're also packeting and flooding these guys and tying up their time and it's on their dime and something I you know I, I say that you know think about what you're gonna do weigh your actions if you feel that you know that whatever you're about to do DOS packeting or, or just being a general nuisance on the net to something if, if you feel this attack is justified and you know the the it, it's the consequences don't outweigh your actions, well, I'm not going to tell you not to do it, straight up. If you feel that you are right, go ahead and do it, but there's going to be consequences. There will be backlash. And make sh ask yourself, am I just, you know, throwing a temper tantrum? Am I getting my nose out of joint because some guy called me a loser on IRC? You know, if, if what something that somebody says on IRC is that important to you, you need counseling because it's just IRC. You know, I, I have seen more wars, I have seen more fights, I have seen more long-term battling going on over IRC. And I don't get it. I have, I've been doing various forms of online chat for at least 15 years on various networks and servers and, and hooking up with people. I, I love the medium. It is a great way to get to know people. You talk to people on a different level. It's cerebral. You're talking brain to brain. Mouth doesn't enter into it. And the dialogue you'll have with someone on IRC is far different than you're going to have face to face with a person. It's it's nice, but on that same token, take it for what it is. It is a conversation. It is interaction. It is not. It's not important, you know. So. So that's about it on that subject. So let's move on. 
wrong button again. There we go. Learning. There's a number one point there, coding versus compiling. And this is a big issue when people are first getting into this. Uh, you can you can you can use the the old Star Wars parable the the good you know the, the the force and the dark and the light side and you know compiling is the dark side coding is the light um, there, there's a happy medium if you need a tool and you need it now there is no sense in like I say reinventing the wheel grab your tool use your tool if you need a port scanner now download it I, it's there's no point in rewriting things that have been written a thousand times and available on any search engine you can find for a file, obviously. By that same token though, if you have been running port scanners, um, I'll use port scanner kind of as, as foo and barf pretty frequently, if you, need, if you have never written a port scanner and you're using them all the time, you would do yourself a world of good, try writing one. Write it in Perl, write it in, in basic, write it in C, write it whatever. Pick, pick a language or pick a weird one. You know, pick something obnoxious off the walls. Try, try writing a, a port scanner in Python. You know, why not? Um, yeah, cool. Um, and and learn how it works. Understand what it's doing. Put your own features. Put your own tweaks. Make it your own personal tool. That is exactly what you want because the goal is not to write the port scanner. The goal is to learn the machine you're on. To understand the machine. Knowing how how. The, the code talks to itself, understanding what is going on inside the machine at the time. This is getting back to the essence of hacking, understanding how it works, knowing what something is doing. Um, you know, that's, that's the idea. When you're, when you're simply just compiling other people's code, you aren't learning a damn thing. All you are is going to 7-Eleven and buying a bag of chips, eating the chips, and throwing the bag down on the ground somewhere for someone else to trip on. That's, that's what, what coding and script kidding is. You typically are not doing anything other than, you know, passing, you know, hey, I take this, I throw this, and it's there. I didn't go get the water, I didn't fill the water, you know. This is, you're wasting space. You're, you're, you're a chunk of, God, you're a chunk of biomass that is, you know, polluting everyone else's time, and you need to just go away. You're not benefiting, and you're not hacking, you're a nuisance. And typically, um, these are the people you find doing the packet floods, going to do the port scanning, uh, getting in IRC wars, watching EFNet crash in a piling, bur uh, burning code, code storm because someone has decided they're going to pack at the servers until they split and try to gain ops on pound feed the goats or something obnoxious. Don't laugh, that's the script kitty channel. Um, so this goes along, like I said, know your code, know your tools, know yourself. If, if you know how to write the code for the tools you're using, you're ahead of the game. And you're on your way to actually doing some true learning um, for these things. And that's uh, it's pretty important for, for getting respect from other people. If you can write your own tools and have written your own tools and can show off that you've done this, then people will understand, hey, this, this guy's actually doing something. He understands what he's doing. And you're going to find it's a lot more interesting and it's a lot more fun because how long do you want to keep downloading and running other people's programs? How long do you want to keep running other people's scripts? Or even more fun, you download a script and you have no idea what the script does. They told you what it does. You don't really know because you can't read the code. There was a neat little code I used to pass around back years back. It was kind of fun. It was called burkop.irc. And this was back when all the new people were coming in onto IRC around 93, 94. And uh, they were all, man, how do I get ops? I want to get ops. I need ops on this channel. I'm going to take it over. Oh. And tell them, hey, I got a script for you. Want to run it? Here. And DCC it over to them. And, and they start running it. And as soon as they run it, I'd know it because showing up in my message window says, says you've got the loser of the day. And it's listing me my little mini menu. Meanwhile, on their side, it's saying, you know, script loaded, what channel do you want to take over? So they type in their channel, it says, losers attempting to do this. And <laughs> it starts playing with echo on, echo off, turning their terminal off on, moving them to various places, and then outputting things just for them to see. And as far as they're concerned, they're taking over that channel. And it says, you know, hacking ops, hacking ops. Meanwhile, it's, I'm sending codes like, you know, let's, uh, let's check their directory. Hey, look at those files. Which ones do you want to wipe out? Shall we kill root? And uh, 
Yeah, you know, the funnest, funnest ones was you uh, you send to it, you uh, CTCP to it Folgers Crystals. And at that point, it wipes out everything in their home directory, their entire mail directory, and anything off the tree, and replaces it with a file named Folgers underscore Crystals. And then it announced this to the entire channel. Uh, you know, they don't know it yet, but we've secretly replaced their home directory with Folgers Crystals. Let's see if they notice. <laughs> But then again, I didn't write it. It was passed to me, so. <laughs> However, I did go through and make a few of my own changes. And of course, like I said before, before I ran it, I read it. And, and I uh, went through and made sure that the code I was about to run wasn't about to do, what, to me, what I'm about to do to somebody else that's stupid enough to run this code. Um, and that's along those lines, you know, next thing you know, of course, okay, more anecdote to go with this one. The other side story was one day I get a little piece of email from one of the admins saying, uh, hi, we, because I'm on an EDU at this time, I went, hi, we'd like you to come in for a little meeting because um, distributing Trojans is not good. <laughs> so I apologized and swore I wouldn't do it again. They groveled and, you know, they said, okay, don't, so. I told them, I said, they didn't have to run the code. And they go, that doesn't matter. Shame on you, Shatter. Bad Shatter. So, okay. So, let's get into the real world. Now that we've done a lot of, we've done the, uh, some of the fictitious stuff here in the abstracts. Okay. Here's the big wake-up call for a lot of people. Life is not television. Life is not the movies. This is not the movie Hackers. Okay? We don't run around with little heads up monocles. We don't rollerblade. And, you know, <laughs> I've never been on a pair of rollerblades, okay? They're, they're, they look like fun. Uh, you know, that doesn't have, they don't run CPM. What's the point? <sighs> so, yeah, this, this is the real world. Uh, I have ran into people and listened to them sitting there and worshiping the uh, the movie hackers going, dude, it's the greatest movie, man. This is this is what it's all about, man. Attacking that mainframe and, and taking over the Gibson and, and, and it's like, oh, shut the hell up. <laughs> Good God. You know, P I, I'm, I'm sorry, Penn Gillette as a sysadmin is funny. If anyone's ever met Penn, you understand why that's comical. Um, and you know, the whole, uh, the Gibson, you know, yeah, it's named after William Gibson. Yes, we've all read Neuromancer. Yes, it's a fine novel. Um, but, oh God, yeah, I can't go on in that movie enough because it was just absolutely hilarious watching it. Um, a television show I liked, uh, it was short-lived, was uh, Level 9 that used to be on, was on UPN. That actually wasn't too bad of a show. I actually ended up talking with the producer last DEF CON. He was here and walked up to me which was kind of humorous because I'm working one of the back doors gooning and uh, all of a sudden this guy walks up and goes, hi, can I take your picture? And I'm like, why? <laughs> and he's like, well, I'm doing a TV show and he gives me his card and he was legit and so we chit chat and he was looking, he was actually here at last DEF CON getting an idea of what one of these conventions is like through use and material on the show and seeing what the people, and they were trying to do it as accurate as possible and after having watched the show, uh, it wasn't bad. It wasn't offensive. Um, yeah, you know, the, the, when you're actually watching hacking, if you haven't, if you're not totally familiar with what hacking looks like, go over to the CTF and watch. And after about two minutes, you're gonna be bored off your ass because it's really boring. You see some guy sitting in a screen like this, and he, you know he's tap 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 tap, and there are the command line just typing little things. It's it's not flashy. You don't see spinning graphics and and polygons and and flying through visually getting this data readout and all this shit and and typing to dodge and oh shit he's coming. I gotta hit arrow key because here he comes and and oh oh god I dodged it. Yeah. Oh no. It's tap 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 return. Tap 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 tap. Tap tap tap. Shit. I mean, that's, that's hacking. It's, it, you know, when you're getting in the computer level, but, you know, so. Um, bullet point two, good jobs perform background checks. And they will check your background. If, if it's any kind of a, of a very, any kind of a high paying position, anything happening in the building. Um, 
a uh, job I was, wor- was going to go on with a guy just this last spring. They were doing the background check on me, and it was pretty funny because he called me up and said, uh, Shatter, it uh, failed. I'm like, oh. uh, okay. So I ran him off list list of little nuisances and, and traffic, everything, including every traffic ticket, every speeding ticket, everything I'd ever done. And he went back and uh, he says, he's, and when I named off him off, he says, okay, let me go back and talk to him again. And then they had their conversation and he goes, yeah, it was the public nuisance. I'm like, damn. And I usually wear that one like a badge, big badge. Yes, I have been convicted, infraction, public nuisance. The people of the state of California found me to be a nuisance. One of them. I did them all. They found me a nuisance. God bless the legal system. <laughs> it bit me on the ass. And they straight up said that, considering the records of everyone else that worked for this guy as a consultant and contractor, that uh, the three million insurance was just not enough anymore. And before I brought on that, I was like the final straw because apparently everyone else works with the guys just as, even worse. They got their little bits of uh, you know Friday night fist fights and other things, and, and they have many as nuisances as well. So. But they will check this shit. So, you know, you, th- you think, you know, something you're doing when you're 18 and 19, that that will hold on and those carry over. And uh, once you turn 18, it doesn't matter what the charge is. Anything in fraction and up stays on your record your whole life. And like I just, you know, my, my case in point, being a public nuisance was too much for these guys to have. And uh, they said not until he had a larger insurance policy, then it wasn't a big deal. So uh, keep that in mind, that uh, things you're doing now might affect you when you want a job in 10, 15 years. And bullet point three, contrary to popular belief, convicted felons do not get government jobs uh, searching for hackers. Getting busted is the quickest way to never get a job in the security field the rest of your life. Uh, It's been a misconception I've heard ever since the first time I got into computers and stuff that, you know, the whole, the the urban legend of, uh, yeah, you know, the government secretly seeks out and gets the most hardcore, the guys that they bust, they go to them and cut them deals to get them to help them secure their systems, and that's how you do it. Bullshit. If they caught you, they don't want you. (laughs) You know, if... You know, you just caught the, I mean, if you catch, okay, you catch a kid's, you know, port scanning and packet flooding your, your, your DSL. Do you go, wow, that was great. You want a job? Fuck no. You tell the kid, mm-hmm. Anyway, so, yeah, um, it don't happen. And uh, so let's get on there, point four. White hat, black hat. Hackers don't wear hats, okay? Uh, everyone of them I know do not wear hats. If they are... That ain't my phone. Uh, if they're going to wear a hat, usually it's something along these lines. I like this one. Thing. I'm, I'm partial to my propeller. It's got a skull, and it's black. That's a hacker beanie. Uh, yeah, no, and yes, it's black. Uh, because I'm wearing a black shirt, black shorts, black boots. So anything else would look silly. Um, yeah, the whole hat thing is such a misconception. Anytime I hear someone like uh, quoted as... Uh, the white hat hacker so-and-so was, to, oh, I want to slap them. That's just as bad. Or when they make reference to, well, these evil black hat hackers were coming in. And, no. Uh, uh, the difference between being a law-abiding white hat hacker and a, and a evil, nasty, plague, antichrist to, to the world black hat hacker, uh, as I say here, distance between those two is about 1.2 seconds. And that's the length of time it takes you from being a nice, happy guy to getting that annoying spam for the 50th time and you decide to uh, check the IPs and you see it's the same IP every time and you decide, huh, let's go check his shares. Oh, look at that window says why he's got his shares wide open. I'm going to nail him. And guess what? As soon as you touch those shares, you just intruded on that computer. If you went across state lines, it's now a federal matter. If you went to another country, it's now an international incident. So that's about the long length of time it takes. And quite honestly, with the amount of people I know on both sides of the fence, the people in the computer security field and the people who I I know through uh, various channels that are on the other side of the fence, uh, there's a lot of overlap. I've never met maybe only one or two really, truly nasty, evil 
hacker types that are out to pretty much destroy everything and they have a pretty short life expectancy. They pretty much get nailed pretty quick because they're pretty stupid. Likewise, I have never met a pristine, perfect guy who is in the computer security field who has never snickered and done a little, uh, ta -ta -ta. watch this. <laughs> Blew his connection off. Anyway, it, you know, it happens. And anytime I hear the self-righteousness, the holier than thou, or the I'm better than you references to white hat, black hat, gray hat, and all that, I give them a big because it's bullshit. Uh, you know, your, your, your action, you know, it's, it's all in your head. It goes back to some of the ethics, the uh, etiquette, and your philosophy. It's, it's what you consider to be right and wrong, and that's the differences, and that's the only place that matters. It is a, putting a good, bad label on it is like saying a person is good or bad. There's all shades of it in between and the absolute worst people in the world can suddenly be a nice guy and the nicest guys in the world can just snap and do something pretty horrible and that's computers is no different it's not any kind of perfect you know everything written in stone and I think I pretty much already kind of covered the concept of responsibility for your actions uh, and that's a big that's a big stickler with me uh, it's one of the things that and, and manners are two things that weigh pretty heavy with me and a lot of the people I know um, you know do what you're gonna do but be responsible about it don't whine don't say someone it's someone else's fault someone made you do it or any other you know asinine excuses that you can come up with if you did it say you did it you know have the balls to do it or don't do it own up to it. Okay. So, we'll go from here. Uh, there's a lot of places to go learning. Um, best places to go, I find, is a bookstore. Um, pick up a book. Pick up a subject you've never done before. Uh, if you haven't worked with Pearl, grab a grab an intro to Pearl book, and uh, you know, start learning Pearl. Start slapping some code out and, and play with it. Um, pick something new. Uh, that's that's going to be your number one source for learning is going to be a book. There, uh, there is no, there is absolutely no substitution for a good, hard, rock solid based knowledge in anything. Um, you can't, you can't learn the wrong thing. There is no wrong thing. Anything you learn is going to open the door to something else, and it's going to be a foundation to learn something more and keep moving and going. Um, my girlfriend was uh, learning learning some H, some HTML and some other stuff, and somebody told her, well, what, why are you bothering? That's a waste of time. It's not a waste of time. Not at all. Uh, she was picking up some, some Visual Basic, and someone else was like, well, why are you doing that? She just go learn C. It's like, why? How, how, what's the, what, what is the point of going and learning C if you don't have the foundation things? And the, and the foundation course that was teaching the basic concepts of computing was using Visual Basic as their learning tool. It was a tool. You could use any language. They chose that for whatever reason because that's what they did. The knowledge you learn is not going to go to waste. So anytime I hear people make references to you know learning something that's wrong or wasted knowledge, um, it's and typically they're trying to just keep you. They don't want you to learn it typically because they probably don't know it and they haven't bothered to do it, and if you go and learn something they don't know, you're gonna be better than them and they're jealous. So, learn what you can, learn anything. But, like I said, my first recommendation is always read a book. And there are thousands on the market to pick up, but anyway. So, finding like-minded people. This is, uh, you know, a lot of times you can do this in the bookstore. When you're browsing books, you find someone looking at the same subject. Um, classes at college, mail list, list serves. Um, there's, there's. I don't remember what the last count of Usenet is. It, it's, I'm wondering if it's reached the 500,000 500, mark yet of groups of, of every possible subject you can imagine for people that are doing anything and everything, hacking anything. I mean, look at the look at the, some of the obnoxious work that's gone into some of the Lego Mindstorm hacking. I mean, Furby hacking. I mean, that was that was a big one there for a while, but, you know, that's one of the things. I mean, if you see something new that comes out and it looks interesting, you know, take, check it out, work on it, see what you can do. And you a good chance you're going to find other people that are probably doing the same thing at some point. Um, so, yeah. Um, obtaining a project. This is another way you can also find people and meet them. Uh, 
like I said, like the Furby thing. Pick a project, pick something big, and it doesn't necessarily matter what it is because the goal is not to, to get from point A to point B, it's to, to go to point A via uh, the town next, next town over and learn all those maps before you come back to B. Picking things up along the way, finding new things, anything you just haven't ever done before. There's there is so many things out there besides learning code, learning TCP IP, learning C, learning Perl. These that's those are that's a speck of dust on the wind of things you can learn and and, and hack on. Um, any new there's I it's such a, it's so many it's hard to even pick one to, to focus on. But what, it doesn't matter what you're working on, the concept is that you are learning, and that's typically what the hacking is all about. If you're coming in, if you want to get, if you're hacking and you're here at DEF CON because you want to learn how to break into a computer, you wasted your money. Go home. Because you missed, you, you missed the boat. Boat took off and ain't coming back. You, you, you're a lost cause at that point. Um, so, avoiding jail. This is always a good one. Um, avoiding jail. Don't break the law. It, it sounds pretty simple, but you'd be surprised how often people break the law because they don't know the law. And ignorance of the law does not exclude you from the law. Before you're going to do anything, check it out. Look into it. Know what you're doing. Um, make sure you're not doing something you shouldn't do. Uh, if you want to practice breaking into computers, your best bet is to build your own local, local network, break into your own systems. And then however you broke into that system, go to that box, repair it, and try to block that. Then go back to your other box and re-attack it. And work on your own system because what you do on your own computers is your business. And you can do anything you please, launch any nasty anything, viruses, email bombs, all of it. As long as you are not sending it outside of your own local network, you're fine. And in fact, it's encouraged. That's a great way to learn. That is an excellent way um, to get into some of the hard hacking because there's many steps to get up to that because before you have your own local area network well you need a network so you're gonna have to get in to learn the networking well before you have your network you're gonna need machines and the best way to get machines build them and you don't necessarily need money uh, because you don't need a high-end machine necessarily to do some of these things this stuff worked great on 486s this stuff worked great on Pentiums. You don't need a 1.3 gig uh, Athlon running 512 uh, megs of RAM to play around with uh, DOS attacks. It's, you don't need it. So you can find probably free machines, parted out machines, or anything else laying around from people you know, and slap them together and build them. I mean, uh, the other day, me and my brother got bored, and we got to talking about it, and we wanted to play a bunch of some of the old old crunch classic DOS games that just absolutely don't run in Windows or they were they were uh, they, they even even using various other things they just they won't run so we started digging around through the drawers and we scrounged up one of our old motherboards we pulled out a chip uh, the only thing we actually ended up buying for the system in the end was we bought a 32 meg stick of RAM for nine dollars and everything else was parts we had laying around we shoved it all in the machine I found an old uh, ancient crusty uh, hard drive that was I think a, it's an 80 meg drive and shove that in there because it's still spun and you know now we got a machine and so we're going to run DOS on it we could easily have put Linux BSD or anything else no it's not going to be the fastest thing in the world but who cares it's 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 it was nothing and along the way if you're going to if you've never done something like that you should and and figure out what's going on and your your best your best thing that can possibly happen is it doesn't work because if it doesn't work, now you got to find out why, and the why it goes back to what, what we're trying to do here, is is the why it's going on, the how, not the fact that it's doing it, not the fact I push this button and you know push that button that happened over there. Ah, oh, neat, I'm done. Nah. Why did it do it when you push the button? So hangover remedies. How many got? How many people got hangovers today? You people weren't having enough fun last night. <laughs> hangover remedy. Best hangover remedy? Don't drink! That doesn't happen at DEF CON. Not when we feature the TCPIP drinking game. <sighs> yes, alcohol and DEF CON go hand in hand. And I don't advocate drinking much. 
I encourage drinking a lot because this hurts. Anyway, so uh, fun stuff at DEF CON. Uh, lectures are always are a great, great source of killing time during the day until the parties start in the evening. And uh, I, I always hear things on news sources and other places, people saying that you know that uh, you know DEF CON's a farce. I think I think Microsoft. I heard yesterday once again this once again denounced DEF CON as being fake, phony, whatever. I look around the room. This don't look too fake to me, unless you're all holograms. Uh, we haven't got those figured out yet, so you must be real, which means we're here, which means whatever we're here we're doing, it's all right. Fuck Microsoft. Um, huh? How do I what? Uh, because that's actually pretty much what was on the laptop. You know, it, it, it's here, it's running, you know, whatever. Actually, typically what I was doing was doing a lot of dialing into uh, my old job with this from the road and in their infinite wisdom decided to go from a standard login system to a uh, to using a Windows networking remote login system and they completely bypassed the intermediary server which used a complete separate login and password and that was to make it easier which I laughed myself silly because well they were simply using everyone's uh, local in office machine login username password and that's if you even bothered putting one on. You know, it's just your desktop machine. Yeah, what do you need a password for? It's a work box. So next thing you know is, of course, someone may want to change their password or they're going to issue a new password. And, of course, they, they you know, email it out in their infinite wisdom, got rid of the wonderful send mail box that we had running that was running, a, was running on a Sun system and uh, threw that out because the company, they only use Exchange Server because, damn it, it's better. We had a virus a week. Or no, actually, we had a virus about every two to three days. They were getting hit with yet another VBS script virus. I hate using that term for the VBS because all they are is a glorified script. But needless to say, of course, it would go through, hack, hack in, take over everyone's machine, email bomb everyone, and you know, could box up and take the email and send it to whoever. So if everyone's passing their passwords around an email like they did, there we go, compromised. Of course, that wasn't the only compromise there. They. Uh, the Unix systems, I think, were set up by people who were MCSE trained, which means they don't con understand the concept of groups. And so the only way it got the entire system to work on the full cluster was everyone used the same login. <laughs> Why not? And even better, when they would write various Perl scripts to handle various other uh, jobs and such, wow, we'll just in the code, oh, Telnet, and this, here's the user and the password. Good, the script runs. And they ran for the next three years. And so anytime they wanted to change the password for, for everyone to use, they had to go through and change every script, some of the programs, some of the compiled code, because they put the user login and password right into the code. And of course, all the source was sitting there. Uh, yeah. The, the, and the sad, the, the, the sad part is, is this is pretty typical of a lot of companies. And, you know, you see in the news that this company got hacked or these guys got dosed or these guys got defaced. And you wonder, wow, how can this be? This is why. Uh, the typical home user or the typical DEF CON attendee's home system is probably locked up 10,000 times tighter than the average corporate system. And I kid you not, uh, guys who are, who are hacking and whatnot back and forth on each other, their systems are far tighter than most anything you're going to find in the commercial industry. And it's pretty sad. But, you know, on the flip side, you know, when they get attacked, you know, I can't be too sad. It's like, well, you were stupid. You know, if you make a, in some of these companies, you make a recommendation about it, and they think you're about to hack them. It's like, no, I want to lock, I want my company's system to be tight if I'm going to be on it. And they think, oh, here, you're talking to security, you're probing the ports. You're, you're going to do something to us, aren't you? Not me. Somebody will, though. So, anyway. Somebody put their hand up. No. Okay, so um, I think we're wrapping it down here. Yeah, I got a few more minutes. Um, so now, do we have any questions? Yeah. Can you uh, elaborate on firewalls? Are you look? Are you talking home based or home corporate? Based. Home based. Um,
most of them boil down to the same idea that what they're doing is uh, there, there's they get down to two types of home systems. You either have one that by default blocks certain port, uh, by default blocks every port. I like those ones. Those are nice. First, or you have the flip side where they automatically leave every port open. You decide what to block. For most people in the home, uh, automatically blocking everything and then asking you if you want it open is a little better. Um, typically, what I'll throw on systems, I actually, I got it on this one here. Uh, this is an old one that is was uh, bought out by uh, Semantic. Bought these guys, and it turned into uh, uh, the internet. Uh, what are they called? Internet personal security or internet security product? The, no, it's the, it's the semantic one. Norton, Norton uh, personal security, I think, or something like that. I don't know. Personal firewall? Okay. This was the predecessor to it called AtGuard, and it's it, it was absorbed by them and stripped down. But the nicest thing about this was it actually blocked ads. And you never I don't see ads on web pages. But it had a firewall here, and you can see it automatically by default. This was a default one here, blocking back Orifice and Netbus. Um, I'm sure had it, had they stuck around or stayed as as they were, they would have probably run sub seven some of the other ones and blocked them. But this one here, by default, blocks all ports and then asks you what you want open. And it was it's pretty friendly. It was decent. Uh, easiest thing is experiment with them, see what you like and what works for you. <laughs> Louder. I got bad ears. Um. Read anything you've never you've never read. That's huh? Oh, uh, yeah. He wanted to know what what books I recommend. I, I straight up say anything you haven't read. If if you've heard about it and you don't know anything about it, grab a book on it and read it. Start there. Um, Usenet, man, you just, it's almost as bad as a search engine. You just punch in something after you download the entire list and find something for a word you're looking for. Uh, word of mouth, too, with some people, you kind of just poke around and see what there are. Uh, a lot of times, some of the real, some of the more intensive ones, the name will have absolutely nothing to do with uh, what the discussion is. IRC, IRC is IRC, man, that's anarchy. <laughs> It's 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 just goes. Um, yeah, it, it also depends on which network you're on. I kind of backed out of most of it. Yeah. I got the first three words. I, I, I'm still. What you have to do, or what he's asking is uh, the legalities of, say, you're attacking your friend who's somewhere else. Uh, it depends on the type of attack, and you have to make sure that you're not violating use agreements with your ISP. Your ISP that you're providing or whatever usually is the first one that's going to say anything about it. And if they allow it, then everyone in between, it doesn't matter. It depends on the type of attack you're doing. Um, if you're straight up dosing, you're going to be dosing everybody in between your two boxes uh, and even packet floods that can be going on too it depends on the type of attack if it's one if it's a if it's a high bandwidth connection just hammering everyone along the lines if you're using a smurf based distributed attack where many are sending to the one um, that will still end up hurting the ISP it depends on on how far up the chain it is so but if you're straight up trying to just do a penetration attack you're probably going to be okay as long as it's consensual, uh, but check with the ISP and see what they what they straight up say, do and don't do. But anything that's going to going to affect any system along the chain, that's typically illegal. That's the easiest way to think about it. And along the same way, ethically as well, make sure that you know you're not hurt, bugging anybody else in your exploration. Yeah.
Uh, not if, unless you have it set inbound, outbound, uh, I'd say no, as well as along the lines of, it depends on the game. I mean, if the game has a, a potential to exploit, then yes, you could. But, um, uh, it, I, I, I'm pretty willing to bet unlikely, because the game is only going to have access to certain resources. And unless it's got the ability, the game itself has the ability to do things like modify your, your master boot record or whatnot, you, you know, you should be all right. Huh. Okay, I'm old. To me, a cracker is the guy who's, who's busting open software. That's how it's always been to me. The, this other term of calling, separating the difference between a hacker and a cracker as being, uh, you know, what they're doing. You know, to me, that's like newfangled thingamajig. But um, it, it, I, I tend to, a lot, some, depending on the cracker, what they're doing, I, I tend to lump them in with a script kitty, which is uh, nine-tenths of all the crackers out there are script kitties. They get on bug track, they look for the newest exploit on what server, and then they exploit that server to deface. And, you know, is that impressive? No, not really. I don't find, I, I don't find, I find defacements to be pretty boring, pretty tedious, and silly. And unless it's really, really well done, uh, New York Times, that was, that was great. That was funny. I sent the, the New York Times hack about three years ago. You can find it. It's, they still want, that, that was, a. Uh, I was hacking for girlies, and they, uh, if you jump on attrition, you can find it in the, uh, the archive. Um, that was beautiful because they cleaned it out. New York Times completely stripped it. And a couple hours later, it's defaced again. It took them better part of a week to track down every little place that they hid the cron jobs and the code and got in and really just, just blew it open. So that was, that was actually pretty good versus going in and, and uh, and nailing a t an IIS server. And the humorous thing is if you look at some, if you go and look at attrition, you can kind of start painting a picture of these defacements and you look at when they hit and you'll see some group will suddenly, this day did 28 defacements. And you go and look at the details of it, every defacement was on the same type of server using the same exploit at the same time uploading the same page. Bang, 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 that's a script. And what they did was they had a little script, they went launch. And they went, look what I did. They didn't do shit. They sat and they, they changed a few variables and said launch. And it went out and started going through hitting systems saying, what are you? No, what are you? What are, you're that? Oh, I'm going to exploit you. Who are you? Who are you? And that's all it is. They just, it's kind of like, it's pretty similar to running a, uh, it's like port scanning. Except they're, ports, they're hitting multiple websites, looking to see what server they run and exploit it. So I, 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 it's not impressive. Yeah, I, 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 I got him. Huh? If you had a dollar to spend on the human factor is almost always the weakest link of the chain. Humans are stupid. They're really dumb. They use birth dates for passwords. They use their social security number. They they use their 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 maiden name. They use pass. They use test. Um, I don't know who it was, but somebody at one point found out that the city cash manager of New York City for uh, Citibank back in uh, 1987, the main root login was uh, user city password cash. I kid you not. And they were that ridiculous. So I mean that's called human error. Right. Yes. That's actually using technology to change human behavior, and that's that's actually fairly good. Your 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 simplest your your basic thing of of, of way of if you're you know, like you said to spend a dollar to secure a system, look at the big picture, draw a big picture of what's going on, and essentially try to figure out what what your weakest point is is. I mean the, the same company I was okay. Same company that was doing the, the past same account for everybody, and we're talking like three, four hundred people um, going on noisy dial-ups and, and coming across DSLs using R, uh, using RSH to log in. We didn't SSH, we RSH. They said SSH was too buggy to use, is what the admins told us. 
I laughed a lot. Um, so their solution was to put up a second firewall. We'll put up another firewall. We'll be even more protected. I kid you not. Two firewalls does not mean twice as twice as secure. Two firewalls means you you've got you're paying admins who don't know jack and shit, and they're just spending more money because they don't know what they're doing and they just think, well, firewall will protect me. Firewall is only as good as the guy who set it up. Firewall is only going to be as good as the guy who who wrote the port blocks. And if you're, if you're, even if you're running a Unix system, if you've got Windows machines on the backside of it and you're not blocking ports 137 through 139 uh, barred from the outside world, that is the biggest hole in the world. And it's in every version of Windows, even the new ones, every one of them. And if you've got 137 and 139 open, you can, you might as well just bend over and spread them because anybody can come flying in with a, with a uh, shares exploit. So that's the, that's, um, in fact, here, here's, here's my tip I tell everybody. Uh, the two things you can do if you are running Windows on your home computer to make yourself almost fairly secure as, as your first line of defense is number one, um, I'll type it right now. Go into, let's see. Uh, all right, let's go. You want to go into, uh, go in here, all right? Delete this file. Destroy it. Devastate it. Kill it. Make it go away. And as a, and if you want, you can even go in and uh, remove uh, the file associations to, uh, to both of. There's two points to dot. There's one to dot VBS and one to something else. If you delete that, you will protect yourself from probably 99% of the email viruses floating around the network today. Um, the, the, this, is, this is the Windows scripting host, and it has one purpose, to run Visual Basic scripts on your system. And I'd say 99.9% .9 of all people running Windows do not run VBS scripts. That's that simple. Yet, the default for all Windows installations is to incorporate this into Windows. Um, the, for anyone that knows Perl and Unix systems, this is the same equivalent as giving root access to Perl programs running under any user. Okay? You should be laughing at that point. Um, that is exactly what that program does. You can tell it to wipe out C. And then when you're wiping out C, you can also tell it, by the way, uh, hide the, the dialog boxes and don't and make itself run completely silent. That is how the I love you virus runs. That's how all these other ones are doing it. They run through that thing there. If you destroy that, you will protect yourself. And number two, like I was saying before, uh, run any kind of personal firewall, public or whatever, and block ports 137 and 139 from outside access on your system. Easiest way is if you're running a DSL or a dial-up, um, designate that land card or, what, or whatever, or if you're not running a home network, then just block it because it's not needed and that will block you from the um, shares exploit, which is, you know, wide open by default on Windows. So between those two, you, you, you're not 100% at that point, but you're a whole lot better than you were two minutes before. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm talking about the Windows networking sharing. Uh, it's the, essentially kind of like a file share system that you, uh, you you, pro, you probe on 137 and then you talk on 139, yeah. But you you can go into anyone's system effectively and and by remote turn it on, access their printers. Um, when we first were playing with this, some guy argued, oh you can't do that, so we dropped the Windows help file to his printer. Every page. <laughs> Made a believer out of him. Oh, wait, louder. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's quite a few of them. If you want to pay, you can use Secure CRT, which is pretty slick. Um, there's also several public domain ones you can download. Uh, if you go to like Google or something or even files.com or whatever, just uh, look for, just put in Windows uh, SSH client and you should get quite a few returns. 
Yeah. 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 Um, probably uh, start with, uh, you can always go to Loft. Loft has got some of their stuff they've done, Loft Crack uh, and whatnot. Loft Crack's a nice one if you're adminning a box to run on your, uh, run against user user account passwords to uh, kind of do a quick, quick, quick hit to make sure they're not using stupid dictionary ones. It's, it's similar to running a dictionary one, but Loft Crack, you can also run Deep Crack and, and do a hard uh, penetrate. There's stuff like that. Um, numerous resources. Um, I don't have one offhand. Uh, like I said, you throw in Google and just type in, you know, hack, um, hacking tools, and you'll probably get at least three or four hundred thousand returns. Um, try to stick to ones that look that uh, that have fairly good references on their site, referencing back to say, like, you know, um, not just saying, "Hi, we like CDC," or "Hi, we like Loft," but um, tied into maybe. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think offhand. Um, places like um, Slash.org, if, if they send you to a tool site, it's just probably a little more on the up and up versus somebody who's backdoored all their tools, which is a big thing you got to look out for. That you know, someone someone distributing it, uh, script kitties can easily backdoor all the tools and put them up. Even things like Secure CRT, um, you know, you you could have downloaded a Secure CRT from somebody and running it, and little do you know that there's actually hidden inside the the actual EXE file is a little keylogger that will uh, once a day send out a, a short little burst back to their system, letting you know everything you've ever typed. So, anyway, okay, uh, it's one, and someone else is about to come on deck, so I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, I'm gooning, and I'm around. Uh, if you want to know anything, come up and ask me. I'm, you know. I'm always around.